Hello, this is chapter 7 in American History 1. Chapter 7 is primarily about the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War. The first theme I want to start off with is about how hindsight can mess you up in terms of understanding how things went. In other words, we know that a revolution is coming. We know that by the battles of Lexington and Concord, if we can even call them battles, there's going to be a war. People at the time did not know. And there's a story at the beginning of your chapter 7 about the Battle of Bunker Hill, which wasn't fought on Bunker Hill, it was Breed's Hill, but anyway. And the big question that one of the characters asks in that story, one of the British officers who's looking out at the militia that had gathered around Boston, the big question he asks is, you know, will he fight? And I think that's an important question, especially in the context of that story. Extrapolate that concept. Think about the colonies in general. It was not automatic that colonists would rise up and reject British government. We know that the revolution is coming, but you have to remember people at that time didn't. Even people who wanted it, they weren't sure exactly how far they were willing to go. There was a period of doubt. It's also important to keep in mind that many of these colonists had never heard of John Locke. You know, we talk a lot about John Locke. We understand that his ideas were very much relevant to the American Revolution. The average American colonist may have had opinions about inalienable rights, or at least their version of, it, uh, of that. But that doesn't mean that everyone had access to reading the specifics like you do in a history class. Also, many American colonists had never had to pay a stamp tax. Why are we talking about this? Well, because everybody had their own reason for joining. And there were tens of thousands of different perspectives on this. You might have two people who disagree completely about political value, but they both decided to join the revolution or the opposite. Maybe they decided to be loyalist. So people are going to have their own reasons for joining the fight against the British. Keep in mind, people are risking everything against a much more powerful English empire, an English army, navy. And nearly everyone around the world who heard about the revolution in its early stages expected a quick victory for the British. There are so many examples in human history of a rebellion that gets smacked down quickly and it doesn't amount to anything. In fact, the vast majority of revolutions or uprisings, revolts, do not end the way that the revolters want them to. So breaking away from the most powerful empire in the world, which is exactly what the British Empire was, it was going to be extremely difficult. Even if things were done perfectly, a little luck and outside help are going to be necessary. So one thing that an independence movement would have to have was more cooperation among the colonies. While that may sound like a simple thing, it was not something that could be taken for granted. So now let's talk about the Second Continental Congress. Now even at this point in July of 1775, there seemed to be an effort by those gathered at the Second Continental Congress to offer the British government a peaceful resolution to the problems, a middle path, so to speak. But the British government, many leaders in the American independence movement as well, they were already committed to war. So the Congress will vote to prepare for war even as they offered peace. But this Congress will be the default governing body of the colonies from the Declaration of Independence until March 1st, 1781. The Congress of the Confederation will replace it then. Now, when word of Congress's offer reached Britain, the British were in no mood to hear it, especially King George III. The British prepared for war uh, immediately. They already considered the colonies in full rebellion. It didn't even matter that some of the colonists were still trying to offer a middle path. And they're going to offer freedom to any slave who joined the fight against the rebellion. If you were a slave in the colonies and you wanted your freedom, one path was to fight for the British and, you know, Spoiler, they did honor that in many cases. Also, uh, the British are going to, right off the bat, use the Navy to bombard the city of Norfolk, Virginia, pretty much destroying the town. So, let's talk about the Declaration of Independence. Now, the Continental Congress became convinced that the time had come to make an official declaration of separation from the British. Now, to do this would mean treason, and there's no turning back at that point. A group of very influential men, talking about Thomas Jefferson, he was 33 at the time, uh, Benjamin Franklin, 
A lot of people don't realize he was much older than the average founding father. He was 70 at the time, and he had many professions. I mean, he was a writer, an inventor, a uh, printer, newspaper printer, uh, like a political theorist. He was a playboy as well, uh, and he was from Pennsylvania. John Adams, he was a lawyer, a statesman from Massachusetts. Robert Livingston, a well-connected politician from New York. Roger Sherman, uh, he was also a statesman from Connecticut. Anyway, these guys and many others are given the task of drafting a document which was basically to explain how and why the colonies were now fully independent from Britain. And so the document they came up with, which the initial draft was primarily the work of Thomas Jefferson, uh, it used those Lockean concepts of inalienable rights uh, and did so to make the rebellion less about taxes and regulatory policies and more about the higher calling of forming a government based completely on consent. No king, no house of lords. Essentially, we're talking about property owners governing themselves with rational laws. That is, if you really want to try to boil it down, that's a good way to think about it. What was this government supposed to do? Well, government was supposed to protect life, liberty, and property, but we're going to call it in the Declaration of Independence, pursuit of happiness. And if the government failed to do this, then it should be replaced. It was a declaration that a government, not doing its job for the people, should be replaced. Uh, one of the ironies is, um, if you believe in the Declaration of Independence, all of it, including that, uh, it makes you ineligible for many government jobs. You're not supposed to ever call for the uh, overthrow of the government. It's one of the questions. Now, the Declaration of Independence said that the justification for all of this came from a higher source than the British Constitution. It came from a creator. In most cases, most of the Founding Fathers were Christian, uh, most Protestant Christian. Some were identified more as a deist, which is basically take Christianity minus the dogma. So minus, you know, things about the virgin birth or Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Um, if you take the, the God element of Christianity, remove the specific stuff that makes it Christian and not Judaism or Islam, and you just take the monotheistic element and makes much less specific claims, that's deism. I can do follow-ups about that if I have specific questions. Um, and so individual liberty and private property were now made the cornerstone of legitimacy of government for the first time ever. So it is a, a unique document in that respect. Now let's talk about loyalists. Loyalist sounds like a good thing, right? Well, American loyalists were those who decided that revolting was not a good idea, that revolution was not a good idea. So American loyalists, not everyone in the colonies was ready for independence or wanted it at all. In the days and weeks after the Declaration of Independence, probably only around a third of Americans actively supported the revolution. In fact, it may surprise you that many Americans were against the rebellion. About one out of every five colonists, 20%, wanted the revolution to fail. Now, many more than that were neutral and more worried about how such turmoil would affect their family, their personal well-being. But for those who wanted the British to win, they were known as loyalists, uh, Tories sometimes they were called. Many times geography decided who was a loyalist. There's a map in your book on page 167 or if you're just listening to this you can google it loyalist map American Revolution that should do it and it shows you that New York City, upstate New York, small dots along the coast uh, and the back country of North Carolina and South Carolina, most of Georgia, these were loyalist hotbeds. Now, the reasons for loyalist sentiment in each colony were various, but one thing all the colonies had in common, their people were judging which outcome, so rebels or the British winning, worked best for their personal lives. Just simply living in areas more easily controlled by British forces, that will convince someone to be a loyalist. You know, what's the point of being a rebel if as soon as you step outside, you're next to you know, a red coat base, and then you're immediately thrown in jail. You have to think about the practicality of it. Where you were located had a lot to do, in many cases, with what side you joined. Now, there were others who lived in areas that were especially damaged during that whole French and Indian War, and they were so sick of violence and instability that they may have been loyalists just because they didn't want any more war. 
They thought that a rebellion was going to cause unnecessary problems just when things were starting to get better. Even though there was a significant population of loyalists, they're never going to make much of a difference in the American Revolution. The patriot side will become much more organized and have much more success in influencing the otherwise neutral majority to support them. All right, the first American army. No matter how great the ideas and arguments of the founding fathers, if the patriots could not somehow survive the British invasion and win the armed struggle, then all those ideas are never going to be realized. But war is a very complicated thing. You don't have to destroy your enemy, and you don't even have to win most of the battles, which the rebellion never did, to win the war. All you have to do is convince your enemy that further fighting is not worth it anymore. But to do even this successfully, the colonies needed an army. They needed officers to lead the army. They needed supplies to keep the army going. And none of these things were going to be easy, as the British had huge advantages in two of those three, and a slight advantage in the third, the slight advantage being leadership. George Washington will become the leader of the Continental Army, which, again, didn't exist whenever he was made the leader of it. American fighting men were nearly all militia. That matters because militia pretty much came out and fight whenever there was a battle nearby their house. And they fought as long as they wanted, and they would come and go as they liked. That type of force could not re ever really defeat the British. The British are eventually going to bring to bear 50,000 professional, highly trained soldiers, along with 30,000 professional German mercenaries. The biggest difference between regular forces and militia, the trick is convincing a person to follow orders despite being scared that they're going to die. And the more training you have, the more experience you have, the better you're able to tame your fear of death. So for militia, they are much more likely to break formation and run away in the vast majority of the cases, almost every case. And regular armies are better at staying put, at least longer than militia. And that's a huge thing in war. It's extremely important. Now, as the Continental Army, the American Army, was created, this militia had to be converted into full-time soldiers, at least a portion of it. And this was a problem for several reasons. One is uh, many of the Founding Fathers didn't even believe that the government should have a standing army, or even a government powerful enough to raise a standing army. A standing army meaning like a permanent professional army. There was a common opinion among many of the Founding Fathers that a standing army is an enemy of liberty. Nonetheless, the Continental Congress acknowledged that in order to actually have a successful revolution, it would be impossible without an army. So this was seen as an emergency temporary requirement. Getting men to fight was more difficult than you may realize. At the beginning of the revolution, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And so a lot of people are going to offer their services to the army. But once the reality sank in that being in a regular army meant that your family would lose money from untended crops back home and that you're going to have to risk your lives against a larger, better trained force that's trying to kill you, that is going to change some perspectives. Add on top of that, uh, even when those soldiers were not fighting, they had to deal with freezing cold weather, lack of food, disease, uh, general lack of any basic comforts. And these things are going to wear on morale. For all these reasons, most Americans preferred the militia lifestyle. But George Washington knew that he needed a permanent army that could go on campaigns. And campaigns, it's an important concept here because you have a battle and then you have a series of battles. Typically there's an objective. You know, you might have to go 50, 60, 100 miles in order to meet your objective and that may require several battles. The militia, if they go home as they please, it's impossible to have a coherent co campaign. So you have to have a standing army that's going to stick around. Now eventually, George Washington will have to worry about widespread desertion, low morale. He has to deal with using a generally weaker force against a much stronger force. Washington will have to adjust his strategy. He's got to avoid large-scale battles. So the British want a big open battle. Washington, the, the Continental Army, does not. They're not set up to win that situation. Washington will have to try to use surprise whenever possible, try to defend in a fortified position as often as possible, basically trying to pick the battlefield and only engage in battle when all of the variables suit the Continental side. Whereas the British are like, let's just fight, come on. Uh, they wanted to use their superior numbers, superior training, superior supplies. It's the same with the, now the United States is the global power. And so the United States would like the enemy to come out in the open and fight and not hide in the shadows. So the British wanted the opposite. They wanted to draw the colonial force out 
into an open battle, take advantage of their superior numbers and discipline. The British thought that they could force the Americans to do this basically by occupying cities. The British say, hey, if you want to avoid us, we're just going to take your cities. You can't have a country without cities. By occupying cities, they would force the colonials to try and protect them or take them back. Fighting in New York and New Jersey, the British decided that they're going to begin their invasion in New York. So there's a large force of 41,000 British and mercenaries will land on Staten Island. The American force opposing them, which is around 20,000 men, they had the job to protect New York City. There was no way they were going to do that. They never stood a chance. But their victory, quote unquote, was that they escaped. By escaping and not being totally enveloped and, and forced to surrender, this allowed the American Revolution to continue. There's a lot of historical debate, military historical debate, about whether or not the General Howe, the British general, should have been more aggressive, that he would have been able to capture Washington's force. And had he done that, there's a really good argument, I believe it, that the revolution would have pretty much been over. General Howe, in his defense, his thinking was lean on the advantages and the only potential threat would be to take unnecessary risk. So why take an unnecessary risk? Because as long as we don't lose any battles, as long as we don't blunder into like a big surrender, then we should be fine. That it's only a matter of time. It, it's a reasonable conservatism. And plus, they had no idea that if they didn't win there, that they might go on and the Americans win. Again, it looked impossible from every angle, uh, from nearly every angle. So instead of hunting down Washington's force more aggressively, Howe ordered his men back into the safety of New York for the winter. He's going to let his Hessian mercenaries, uh, the German mercenaries, defend the land that he captured to the south in New Jersey. So by the end of 1776, long story short, Washington's force only had about 3,000 men from originally 20,000. A lot of that is just going home, desertion. Very little of it is battle death. But Washington, who was desperate for a victory because morale was low, I mean, it, it looked to Washington like, hey, if we don't do something soon, we might as well give this thing up. Um, he didn't say that, but that was the situation. So Washington was desperate for a victory, and on Christmas Day of 1776, Washington's forces crossed the Delaware River. So that famous painting where he's like standing up on one leg, well, he's standing on two legs, but, you know, he's got the, the Captain Morgan thing, and there's ice in the water. Anyway, crosses the Delaware River, surprised a group of about a thousand German mercenaries, most of which were probably drunk because of an earlier Christmas celebration. Washington's army will force them to surrender. About a week later, the Americans scored another victory at Princeton, New Jersey. So these victories, they weren't really that important in terms of the military situation, but they were important just to show the soldiers that they could win. So they, it was morale was the biggest reason to keep things going. Uh, that those battles were significant. But much more than, but much more important than those American victories was the anger caused by the British occupation of the cities. If you remember, the overall goal of the British invasion was to reestablish imperial control. In order to do this, eventually, at some point, you have to convince the colonists to give up or to support you. You can't just try to kill off the army and then expect everybody to go back to normal. The goal is not simply to win on the battlefield. It is to establish the peace back to where it was so you can make the money again. The problem is, is that British occupation forces were pissing off people everywhere they went. And not so much because of violence or physical abuse, like, you know, the Mel Gibson movie where they put everybody in a church and burned it down. That didn't happen in the American Revolution. That was inspired by, actually, Nazis in France that did that. Anyway, so not so much because of violence and physical abuse. That did happen, but that wasn't the overwhelming reason. Basically, when you have a bunch of rowdy, unwelcomed, many times arrogant soldiers disrupting your normal life, it can anger you. And so many former neutrals or even maybe loyalists are going to change their mind during the occupation in favor of the revolution. Despite the fact that Washington's army is depleted and the military situation looks pretty good for the British, because they're pissing people off so bad, they're actually a little bit further away from total victory. All right, fighting for the American capital, which is Philadelphia at the time. General Howe, like I already said, did not like to hurry or take too many risks. He felt that because the British so hopelessly outclassed the Americans that his biggest enemy was risk. And again, it was not altogether a stupid assumption, but it is also true that he probably could have won the war early had he been more aggressive. After capturing New York, Howe thought he would surely be able to lure the Continental Army into an open battle by going after the capital, Philadelphia. Washington will be forced to react. He couldn't allow the 
capital to be taken with no fight. That would be devastating for morale. So the Americans fought, and they fought with Howe's force, but uh, twice, and they were beaten both times. The British will occupy Philadelphia, but again, they're not going to make any friends while they're there. On the way to Philadelphia, British soldiers looted whatever they wanted. This behavior is going to increase the number of former colonists who volunteered to fight the British. Now, the most important battle in the American Revolution is Saratoga. That's the next section, Saratoga. Now, remember the British still owned Canada as a colony, and it was extremely loyalist. So Britain felt comfortable keeping a base of operations in Canada, and they're going to decide to send a large force down into New York from there. So the plan was this force would meet with Howe's force and then cut the colonies in half yet again. But things did not go to plan. A group of British soldiers, and there were about 7,000, and they were led by a guy named General Burgoyne. He was a quite a character. Eventually, they're going to become bogged down because they were trying to haul around too much stuff. They were not as mobile. The militia, though they were less disciplined, less well supplied, they were much more mobile so they could outmaneuver the British forces. So the more mobile militia forces of the Americans were able to harass the British, finally surround them, compel the entire force to surrender. So this victory for the Americans was important not just for the troops and the equipment captured, but much more importantly it showed the world, and most importantly France, that the Americans just might have a chance to win. France becomes involved, that's the next section. In class I asked you guys, you know, what do you think France thought about the revolution? And there's a couple ways to think about that. What, is, what does France think about the revolutionary ideal? Well, France was an absolutist monarchy under Louis XVI. They didn't give a damn about the revolutionary ideals of the Americans. If anything, they thought they were silly and dangerous. But one thing they did care about was hurting their rivals, the British. So basically, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The American victory at Saratoga, because of this, was actually celebrated in Paris. There were parties. And the impact Saratoga had on the French perception of the war made it the American Revolution's turning point. So without the French, there would have been no American victory in this war. And sorry to sound, if that sounds un-American, it's the truth. There's no way. What supplies, the Navy. So why was France so important to the American colonists? The colonists had no Navy. Without French naval assistance, the British would have been able to resupply and replenish their troops indefinitely. Also, the colonists didn't have the supplies or the money to fight a war of such magnitude. The French provided most of the gunpowder the American forces used during the whole war. The French sent artillery as well, ammunition, clothing, nearly all other forms of military gear, anything to help the Americans defeat the British. Another big thing was the French are eventually going to declare war on the British all over the world. And the British, from their perspective, had much more important possessions than North America. And so as a result, they're going to pull forces out of North America to fight in other places like India. So that in and of itself is a huge deal, even without the French Navy, though that helped too. So after Saratoga, the French formally joined the fight and declared war on Britain all over the world. So this forced Britain to save most of its resources for fighting France, which reduced the pressure on American forces. France formally recognized the United States as an independent country on February 6, 1778, and the two entered into a military alliance. Spain will later join France and help them against the British. Remember, Spain was down in Louisiana, and uh, Spain will send a lot of supplies to the rebellion up the Mississippi River. Now, by 1780, the British found themselves at war with many other countries as well. When you're at the top, you tend to be a jerk, and a lot of people dislike you, not just because they're jealous, which I'm sure that's some of it too, but because you tend to bully people, Britain, now America, anyway. And so by 1780, they were, the, they were at war with the Dutch too. The next section is an important thing to consider, the awkwardness of France as an ally. Think about why might it have been controversial for the United States to turn to France as an ally? Well, one of the biggest reasons is if the entire point of the revolution is a government based on consent and that a monarchy is backwards and, you know, not the right thing to do, your big ally is an absolutist monarchy. So even more of a centralization of power in one person than Britain. George III didn't have nearly as much power as Louis XVI. Also, another element of the awkwardness is that the English colonists, a.k.a. the American colonists, had been fighting against the French their whole lives. Remember that whole French and Indian War, Seven Years' War? And then before that, the French were the rivals. Also, France was old-school Catholic. The vast majority of Americans were Protestant. 
So that, that may seem like a minor little thing, but back then it was not. Why did the American rebels end up joining with the French? Well, they had to win. And one thing we've talked about in class, and I will talk about in several videos, is the biggest theme in American history is the conflict between trying to uphold ideals and trying to be practical whenever there's a crisis. Ideology versus practicality. That topic shows up in every significant chapter of American history. And so if anyone wants to understand why is the United States so vastly different now than it was before in terms of values and laws and things like that, it's crisis management. So the first crisis was, hey, we've got our ideals, but they won't amount to anything if we can't win this dang war. All right, so weakening American force rebounds. Now that the British had to scramble their forces all over the world to meet the challenges of more powerful enemies like France and sort of Spain, but mostly France, the British decided to withdraw from Philadelphia back to New York. So just by France declaring war around the world, Philadelphia was abandoned by the British. By 1777, even though the international situation looked a lot better for the rebellion, if you looked at the Continental Army, you would get a different feeling. Washington's force, who was forced to sit outside Philadelphia for the winter, and it was a very bad winter. They were there for months before the British withdrew, and they had been literally starving, not first world problem starving, actually starving, freezing suffering immensely. Continental Congress could not afford to pay them. So morale was very low, even after the British pulled out of Philadelphia. Most of the influential, wealthy politicians who identified as patriots, most of the time they had very little to do with the actual fighting and the actual suffering and dying that was happening on the front lines. Many rich patriots simply paid a poor person to fight in their place. And so it is true that the revolution was largely being fought by the poor, the landless, the unemployed. They were criminals as well. Pretty much all those who didn't really fit into the Founding Fathers' idea of political participation. And we'll talk more about that later. But the Founding Fathers were not, they did not like the idea of democracy. That seems to be a shock for a lot of people. Democracy was not an original value of the Founding Fathers, not for the vast majority of them. Uh, it was a republic, that should, you know, but there should be represented, uh, it should be led by the best of society, not all of society. We'll get back to that later. Frustration and resentment at the lack of supplies, and of course the fact they weren't being paid, this is going to percolate in the camps of the Continental Forces. But in the spring of 1778, supplies finally reached the, most of the soldiers, and another perhaps just as important bit of help arrived with a Prussian mercenary, Prussian mercenary Baron von Steuben. Von Steuben was very important because being a mercenary, he was uh, had a lot of experience and he instilled Prussian discipline. Uh, and he used his vast experience to make American soldiers a much more reliable fighting force. And this is going to help improve morale and effectiveness in battle. So now a rejuvenated Continental Army marched towards New York. But after an inconclusive result with the British forces outside the city, the American force was unable to retake New York. So after this stalemate, the biggest challenge facing the Continental Army was, again, simply not falling apart. Frustration and anger I mentioned earlier, it began to resurface for the same reasons, and large chunks of the American Continental Army will mutiny. And the mutiny became so severe that many rebellious soldiers, which is funny, rebels of the rebellion, double rebels, so rebellious soldiers actually marched on Philadelphia, their own capital, and demanded action. Order was restored, but only after Congress promised more supplies and back pay to the soldiers. And some of the main rebellious rebels were also executed. The American Revolution and the Frontier. As we've talked about several times in class, when European powers are fighting one another in North America, Native Americans are going to become involved whether they want to or not. So the impact the American Revolution had on natives should be pretty familiar to you by now. Certain native groups were pressured to join one side or the other. Again, this will weaken the native confederacies and result in further depopulation and vulnerability. While the American Revolution meant independence and more political influence well, by the wealthy and middle class landowners, it meant something very different for Native Americans. And this was actually, so the American Revolution was the largest blow to the Native Americans' ability to govern themselves the way they want since Europeans first arrived 
about 250 years before. I know we've talked about many other examples of Native Americans and an event that reduces their sovereignty, this more than all the others. So this political instability was made much worse by yet another smallpox pandemic. Fighting and chaos led to malnutrition. Your immune system needs food and water, and that's gonna make natives much more exposed to disease. And this outbreak and spread of smallpox hit every corner of the continent, far beyond the frontier with English and American colonists. This smallpox outbreak, this smallpox outbreak will kill over 130,000 Native Americans. To put this into context, the entire American Revolutionary War only involved 8,000 battle deaths. Total deaths related to the war directly were around 21,000. 130,000 Native Americans died of smallpox during this time. That goes to show you it's even bigger story in Native American history than it is in Western history. Civilians and the war, the next section. Like we discussed already, many American colonists, regardless of which side they originally supported, experienced material loss during the war, either from you know their homes being destroyed or their farmland, or maybe having their property seized for military emergency on either side, having soldiers take what they wanted. The lives of civilians were heavily impacted. Another important factor in how civilians dealt with the war is that many colonists looked after themselves more than caring for either cause. And a lot of times when people read history, they tend to judge comments like that. They say like, oh, well, they were cowards or they weren't patriotic. If you think about reality, if you have a family, it's normal to care a lot about your family. And it might be less normal to care more about whether or not your country is independent than your family. So... If you have a choice to go out and risk everything and join this independence movement, but you have to leave your family behind and you don't know what's going to happen to them, that's a choice. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, it's not a, a necessarily a cowardice versus not cowardice. So, you know, e even if it wasn't life or death, if you had a business or you had a farm and it goes under, when the war's over, which it will be one day, how are you going to take care of it? You know, it's not like that if the revolution didn't work, that the British were going to kill everyone in the colonies. That, that, that's not how it happens most of the time. So in this environment, many of the poor Americans were upset that their lack of wealth made them more vulnerable. They're going to develop ideals during this era, like whatever government comes after this should be sure to protect them as much as anyone else. The basic fact is this was not popular with most of the founding fathers. The concept of universal suffrage or even allowing white men with no property to vote, this was extremely unpopular with the founding fathers. I'll give you a quote, all right? John Adams said, quote, the democratical demands put forward by the laboring classes were just as odious as British regulatory measures. So it's equating the very reason that John Adams and people like him want to break away from Britain, or one of the big reasons, with the laboring classes wanting to be just as involved in politics. They were both just as bad. So that gives you some scale, some perspective. The Founding Fathers argued that class distinctions were important and they were natural. In order to prosper, most Founding Fathers believed that low classes had to understand their place and that they needed to treat their betters with deference. Natural rights did not really apply to everyone for the vast majority of the Founding Fathers. The biggest reason why, it was not seen as practical. So blacks, like Native Americans, they were looking to see which side could offer them freedom. Thousands of blacks took up the British promise of freedom if they joined them. Others fought for their masters in return for promises of freedom. But the real result was that the position of free blacks and enslaved blacks did not change for the better after the war. During the war, the issue of slavery was exploited by Britain, was feared as a potential weakness by slave-owning colonists. Britain's Southern Strategy The British took a step back and they looked at their strategy in late 1778. They saw that things seemed to be getting away from them, so how could they adjust to finish this thing off? They decided that the South was much more important than the North because of its strategic position close to the Indies, the Caribbean, and it was far more lucrative, profitable, because of agriculture. So the British shifted their resources and the men down south to try to win there first so they could later easily finish off the north. Um, south Carolina, Charleston in particular, very, very lucrative colony. Now one thing that made the war in the south very different than up north was that there was a large amount of guerrilla style warfare. You had the, the worst atrocities were between loyalist militia 
and Patriot militia around upstate South Carolina, western North Carolina, northern Georgia, torturing to death, civilian massacres happened frequently. The siege of Charleston, the British began their southern strategy at the southernmost and easiest colony, Georgia. Lots of loyalists there. The British were able to quickly capture Savannah. Then they're going to turn their eyes on South Carolina. The British are going to lay siege to Charleston at the end of 1779. After bombing the city and setting fires, Charleston surrendered on May 12, 1780. The plan was now to march north and capture Virginia, but things get complicated in South Carolina. If I ever have an autobiography, that has to be a chapter of it. The idea of moving the British army northward with no real opposing army in the way sounded a lot easier than it ended up being. South Carolina had a reputation for guerrilla warfare and brutality. Way back in 1775, some South Carolinian patriots kidnapped, tortured, and murdered backcountry loyalists. And ever since then, the hostility and violence had been at a fever pitch. Groups of unorganized South Carolinians took their own initiative to raid and kill other South Carolinians on the other side of the struggle. So life was scary around here. Of course, there are going to be criminal elements that take advantage of the chaos. They don't even care which side wins. They're going to loot and murder wherever they could. This whole situation was not ideal for anyone, but it was not ideal for the British as well, who simply wanted to get through this area with their army intact. And so in this time of chaos, many became convinced that the British were primarily responsible for all this violence. Violence, and so the number of rebels are going to swell as a result. And very effective partisan fighting, guerrilla-style fighting, led by men like Francis the Swamp Fox Marion, the Gamecock Thomas Sumter. These are going to cut supply and communication lines of the British forces. After a significant victory at Kings Mountain, many South Carolinians, well, Carolinians in general, became convinced that the best way to restore order was to back the rebellion. But while the partisan warfare was going well enough for the rebels, conventional battles were different. The Continental Army lost at Camden in August of 1780. Now, after this, the American rebels decided to split their forces. Typically, that's a terrible idea, but in this case, it caused the British to split their forces and chase them. Eventually, the British force realized that regardless of its ability to defeat militia or the Continental Army on the battlefield, that they had no chance of gaining any political control in this area. In other words, they would win a battle and then things would go right back to chaos as soon as they moved over. Similar, if you know anything about the the American perspective in the Vietnam War, a hundred soldiers would die taking a hill, and then they would abandon the hill the next day, and the North Vietnamese or Viet Cong would take it back. So the British were rediscovering something that has been forgotten a hundred times in military history. Beating the enemy is usually not how you win wars. To really win, at some point, you have to convince people to support you, or at least stop resisting. All right, Yorktown and the end of the War. By 1781, the British still believed they could finish this war by conquering Virginia. The British sent the largest chunk of their army there with a plan to dominate the region. But a mix of good fortune and French naval power would unexpectedly turn the tide on British forces. The Continental Army had been joined by French soldiers outside of New York City by 1781, but a French Navy was able to sneak up on the British forces in the Chesapeake and blockade them. At this point, Washington ordered his force south from New York to help encircle the British. Once the British force failed a breakout attempt, they were done. So Lord Cornwallis, who was the British general running the show in Virginia, at Yorktown, he's going to surrender his entire force. This devastating defeat and the loss of 7,200 soldiers would not have been enough by itself to force the British to give up the war. Had the British still dominated the Atlantic Ocean and had America been the only theater of war, the British suffered setbacks in Europe and India and other places around the world during this time. And if the British debt wasn't beyond dangerously high, then Britain could have kept fighting. But all those factors combined convinced Britain it was in their best interest to pull out and recognize American independence. It was just too many problems. Post-war negotiations. It's a very interesting scenario during these post-war negotiations. Sometimes history students tend to assume that once the rebels win, then the borders are set. It's like, we won, there's the borders. It's not that easy. This was a very dicey negotiation. The post-war negotiations were very complicated. They involved a lot of secret meetings, playing one side off on the other, switching allegiances. Now, those responsible for the American peace negotiations were guys like uh, John Adams, John Jay, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Henry Lawrence, a South Carolinian, Lawrence County, William Temple Franklin, Benjamin's nephew, he got in. Things got complicated because the new American states relied on France to back them up. If France pulls out their support, then France doesn't care about the United States, okay? 
I'm not saying that necessarily now, though, I mean, whatever. France cared about hurting Britain or getting as much from Britain as they could. So theoretically, the French could have easily said, hey, you know what? If you give us this over here, some other part of the world, then we'll back you up if you want to keep Georgia and South Carolina. Or we'll back you up if you want to keep, you know, Massachusetts. They wouldn't want to keep Boston, that's for sure. But, you know, theoretically, they could have easily betrayed the Americans. So if France made their own treaty, this may make it easy for Britain to just invade all over again and retake the colonies. John Jay in particular was worried that the French would use some American land to bargain to get other desires they had, like Gibraltar for Spain. Gibraltar is a, an extremely strategically important base right at the connection between the Western Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, between Spain and Morocco. So because of this, the United States will move very quickly to sign their own treaty with the British. They even hinted that they would back away from friendly relations with the French. So you can imagine the French necessary for the Americans to win the war. Well, the United States felt like it had to say, well, you know, we only fought with them because we had to. There was no other way we were going to beat you guys because you're really super strong and tough. So now that we won, we have no interest in being friends with them. So here's the deal. If you support the borders we want, we'll back away from France, almost like it never happened. Even so, this whole agreement still depended on some agreement between Britain and France, and then Spain as well. The Peace of Paris, one of the millions of Paris treaties. On September 3rd, 1783, Britain formally recognized that the United States existed all the way up to Canada and all the way down to the border of Florida, and Florida was given back to Spain.